Played about three to five sessions with a GM who first ran a fun little combat scenario, and then a little quest in a forest. All good. No issues. Then we get to a big city, where there's basically endless possibilities. And we, first, spend a whole session waiting in line at the fantasy DMV, second, spend a whole session walking to a church on the other side of town, and third, finally get a quest to do. Huzzah! But whenever we try to follow up or get details so we can do the quest, he asks us, Who are you asking? Where are you searching? How do you open the box? But he has not described any NPCs or locations for us to search, so it's difficult or impossible to give more details. We finally call the game when we point out to him that we haven't really gotten any details with which to investigate further, and he kind of railroads us from point A to point D without describing anything. Unfortunately, he doesn't take the talking to very well, and loses his motivation to DM. That said, I met a player from my longest running group in this game, so it wasn't as bad as it could have been. If you're trying to engage your players in the theater of the mind, then you must first build a good theater. It needs props, actors, and a set designed for them to all be interacted with. If you give players a room with four corners, each painted white with no visible exits or entrances, completely bereft of anything interactable, and then you ask them, Oh, so what do you do? Don't be surprised if they look at you like you're insane. My name is Jacob Crow, and welcome to the Crow's Perch, where I spend my evenings planning murders and narrating RPG horror stories. And speaking of tabletop games, this episode could not have been possible without today's sponsor, Song of Sirens. Song of Sirens is a brand new tabletop role-playing game about venturing into the high seas of an alternate history of the 1930s, fused with fantasy, where the seas have risen and mystical powers fuel the fleets of admirals across the seven seas. Admirals like you. As an admiral, you alongside your fellow admirals can hold back the tide of warring nations and the undead fleets of banshees. But you're not alone as powerful creatures known as Sirens sail alongside you. From the beautiful and deadly Dominique de la Croix of France, to the ruthless Japanese Oni, Nomuro Katsumi, the power of Sirens is sought after by every nation. Some hold them captive, using them as weapons, but those who made friends, or even lovers of their Sirens, can access a deeper pool of their powers. Oh, you caught that lovers part? Well, guess what? That's because there's a fully-fledged relationship mechanic in this game. Want to live out your dreams of cooking a homemade dinner for your jacked Valkyrie girlfriend as you conquer Spain? <laughs> yeah, boy. Or perhaps woo a dummy mommy French vampire siren as you plot the seeds of revolution in Germany. That's not the only seed being plotted tonight, if you know what I'm saying. Then you, too, can attempt to form a bond with your siren by appealing to them or offering gifts to increase their relationship levels with you. And the best part is, the stronger your bond, the stronger they become in a fight, even if they're underleveled for an encounter. So why not take a dive into Song of Sirens today by supporting their Kickstarter before it ends on October 8th, either by clicking on the link in the description down below or on the pinned comment in the comment section, and become an admiral today. Now, on to the next story. Hey, first time Redditor here. Sorry in advance for any mistakes. English is not my first language. I, female, 31, am DM of the group. The other players are a wizard, a fighter, and a cleric. Cleric, male, 60, is the problem here. Playtime is mostly fine. It's out of character. Where cleric gets really uncomfortable. On to the story. I recently came off-handedly out to the group. At that time, just fighter and cleric, and fighter already knew. Cleric wants to run a campaign in the future, and was asking what my type in men was, so that he could make sure they were included. I just very dryly responded that that was the wrong gender. Cleric was silent then, and I thought that he had taken the news well. Well, guess again. The next day he sent me PMs, asking if I was sure, because a few years back I had told him I wasn't gay, and if I ever had sex with a man, he apologized but mainly for hurting my feelings, not for being flocking disrespectful. Also, please note the age difference. He could easily be my father. The thing is, he has a history of sending me PMs, where he jokes about that he wants to invite me out for a coffee, or that if I ever move again, I could move in with him and share his bed. Luckily, 
those PMs only pop up once every half year. I'm going to pause the story right here for a second, just so everyone else who's watching can just soak this in. Really laying it down smooth, huh? Yeah, buddy. Let's just cozy up on my bed like a couple of pals. Also, a 30-year age difference? If she's not even born yet by the time you can drink, yeah, I'm gonna think it's pretty weird. And I already know that someone in the comments is going to say, oh, but their dad is 60, dating a 40-year-old. But I think there's a considerable difference when their prospective partner is in their 20s. Age gap discourse on the internet is often myopic and generally really flocking stupid. However, can we all just agree that this is kinda weird? At the very least? Alright, let's just keep going. I actually made a character for his campaign, Male Ranger, as I really, really don't want to run any risks of him using his DM status to give him more power than necessary over my character. And I even made a backup character, where I commented that I have experience being in that character's head, because I actually wrote about him for 12 years. His question? Are you sure you're experienced to be in his mind? Or is it rather that he has been on your mind? The subtext being, of course, again, that I am not really gay, because I think about a male character. It is so flucking tiring. TLDR, I came out to one of my players, who had already shown interest in me, and now he keeps on making jokes, which make me uncomfortable. Look, in a post-pandemic world, I understand trying to shoot your shot at the table. And sometimes it actually works. But just based on what was said in this story, it sounds like the OP already made it clear they weren't interested well before they told them that they were gay. Your magic cock won't suddenly make her like guys, just as much as choosing pronouns in Starfield won't suddenly make you trans. FUCKING PRONOUNS! I was a player in my friend's campaign, which had been ongoing for over a year. During this time, my fiancé and I separated, which was one of the hardest things I've ever done, but was also for the best. A few months later, two weeks before the wedding date, my ex texts me to let me know that she's seeing someone, and that it's our mutual friend who also happened to be part of the campaign. He was my closest friend at the table, apart from the DM, and had been my friend for multiple years. He even had multiple talks with me about my breakup, and had been a proverbial shoulder to cry on. So to me, this felt like a major betrayal. I texted the DM to let him know that I wanted to step back from the campaign for a while. But thankfully, he responded by kicking the other player from the group to support me. We've since started a new campaign without the problem player, but it sucks that it had to come to that. Not your typical horror story, but I think it still fits. Oh, I 100% agree that this is a massive betrayal. This is like Tenet 1 of the bro code, etched in stone in the Tablet of Homies. Thou shalt not riz your homies girl, even when thine relations be strained. Therefore, I sentence this player to lose his status in brohood, in addition to seven years in the getting kicked in the balls chamber. May bro Sidon show you mercy. Why did people not read? I will start by saying I have a very preferred style of DMing. I have been a professional DM for three years, DM for seven, and I think all play styles are valid as long as everyone on the table is enjoying them. But I, myself, enjoy the most the storytelling elements in my campaigns. If you allow me to, I'm really hands-on with the past of your character, to make this PC the main character of their own story. Keyword, if you allow me to. Now, I know this is not everyone's style, so I'm very forward in asking people, how comfortable are they with me putting my spoon on their backstory? I write it underlined on the character creation rules, and in my player questionnaire from session zero, I have a very specific question asking if the players are interested in that approach, if they would allow me to make changes to their pass, and if there's something I should stay clear from. Enter player zero. I was looking for people to start a new game. Player Zero found me through Start Playing, and he was interested and excited. I sent him the player questionnaire, safety forms, and character creation rules. All seems good. As time passes, and we are still missing a couple of players, Start Playing charges him automatically. This was my bad. I apologized and asked him if he wanted me to send the money back, and he told me that he preferred to save it for his first payment. I cancelled the game in Start Playing so it would not charge him again and got the money out. All cool. As the game starts to fill up, I start working with the character concepts so I can weave them into the world. I checked Player Zero's form, 
His answer choice for this, do whatever, surprise me, and no to the question, is there something you wouldn't want me to mess with? Awesome. I started sending him messages about things I found optimal, such as changing his family's enemies to a group of NPCs that are relevant to the adventure. Said NPCs would remain the same, just basically reskinned. Change a monster that gave him powers to a different monster that is related to the campaign. The bare bones remain the same. Things like that. Keep in mind, even with all I previously said, I still ask if something is okay. At this point, I have noticed he's been more... quiet. When, one day, I asked him if the mark he had from his encounter with the monster could be something different to fit the new theme. Apparently, this was the last straw, as he told me he was dropping the game. That he felt I was messing too much with his backstory, and he felt like that was a red flag, since for him, player agency was relevant. I was flabbergasted by this, given all the previous context. Also, jumping the gun a bit with the player agency thing, and told him that all the changes I suggested were for his benefit, and because I thought it would improve his experience, but that if he didn't like them, he was never obliged to any. He said that he had only been nodding along since he wanted to be accommodating, but that it soured his experience. Again, still shocked by this, I asked him if he wanted to reconsider, given that I have had games and players whose backstories left completely independent. It was even one of the options in the questionnaire. He did not respond to that. After a day, I asked if he was still there, and if he was still sure of not wanting to stay around, since we have not even had a chance to have a session zero and see these exact points. Nada. No answer. Two days pass, and I sent him a last message, where I tell him that I assumed his silence means that he's still dipping out, and ask him if he wants his money back and how to send it. He apparently ghosted me. It's been four months since that. The campaign just finished its first act, and we are having a blast. The new player that got in instead of player zero is amazing, and we love him. I'm just still in disbelief of that whole experience. I gave every chance for this guy to tell me what he wanted, and yet, here we are. Why won't people just read? Anyway, I don't think I'm in the wrong here, but I suppose I'll leave that for the Reddit gods to decide. Maybe there is something I'm missing. Nah, I don't think so. You covered all your bases and more, and you brought it up with the player to discuss every single change. You did the most you can do, but at the end of the day, if the player has opposition to your suggestions, that's when they are supposed to say something, so you can both hash it out. A game is a conversation after all, and a conversation requires back and forth. You can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him fill out the rest of the backstory on his character sheet. I'm pretty sure that's how that saying goes. Content warning for sexual themes. So despite role-playing for a while, I had never played The Curse of Strahd before. Plenty of my friends complimented the campaign. So of course, I was curious to experience it. Finally, I came across a chance to participate as a player. I'm a forever GM, so this was a welcome change for me. Plus, I hadn't played D&D for ages, as I run other games. I didn't really know the DM. He had played in some of my games, but I didn't know him as a person. He was a good player, although tended to play morbid characters. Since I mostly run horror, that was fine, but maybe I should have seen the pattern. The campaign starts with a session zero with me and three other players. The DM goes at great length to list all the possible trigger warnings, from gaslighting to sexual abuse and necrophilia. He pretty much has a monologue listing them for like 30 minutes. I thought he was being thorough, but in hindsight, he was a bit too excited about them all. First five, six sessions go in an ordinary way. We enter Barovia and investigate things. Strange dreams visit people. Weirdness starts when we first meet Strahd on the road. The DM goes at great length to describe the tightness of his leather pants and the fit of his clothes, how high and mighty his cheekbones are, and how dominating his gaze is. It goes to an uncomfortable length. I get amused because it starts to feel like fan fiction or a parody, but I keep it in check. After the session, the DM sends every player a private message. I later find out going on and on about how alluring and awesome Strahd is. He just gushes on and on. I give a neutral reply, and the conversation dies. I'm glad it does, and start to get weird vibes. I keep playing because, hey, I love GMs who are excited about their games. I give him the benefit of doubt and think that maybe he's just really into the campaign in a healthy way. 
Well, it gets worse. One of the players was apparently receptive to his fantasy of Leather Daddy Strahd in private messages, so he starts favoring her in-game. Basically, all shitty things, which are part of the campaign theme, no doubt, happen to the three other players, me included. She is safe from them, because she shares his glee about how hot Strahd is. I know this because they discuss the cursed hotness of Strahd on the Discord channel we have for the campaign. Since campaign is horror-themed, I don't mind the bad things, but I do note the favoritism. Another red flag is how the DM is seething when we have discussions about moral issues among ourselves. That is, discuss these things as our characters see them, and as what would be the right thing to do. These are completely in-game discussions, and ones that I enjoy a lot. The favored player pipes in with nihilistic views, and on how hot it is that someone just acts on their impulses, and how good guys make for the most boring stories. She is playing a bard. This gets her an inspiration from the DM, who seems pleased. The rest of us get more shitty things. Everything we do to try and help someone is rewarded with more shit. I'm not certain if this is part of the campaign, or what the DM just likes. After we get Strahd's book in the town, which name I've forgotten, with the necrophiliac noble lady and crazy mare, things really get out of bounds. First, we get the insight into Strahd as a child, and he keeps describing Strahd's noble looks with strange gusto. I get the feeling that he is attracted to a definitely underage version of Strahd. The player who is into this shit flirts a little with the child Strahd, but I'm so glad it leads nowhere. Instead, she insinuates she will definitely bone him when he gets older. Ugh. Things are getting mighty uncomfortable. When Strahd arrives to the crazy town on a flaming horse and burns it down, I finally get enough. The DM describes the scene as something that causes self-destructive attraction in all characters, regardless of what the characters want. To get sodomized by Strahd's flaming horse as a way to get closer to him, as we want the real thing so bad. The session ends in the cliffhanger of Strahd appearing. I'm quite blindsided by this turn of events. The player mentioned before is practically manic with glee. The rest of us exchange stunned glances. Discord is full of message notifications when I get home, and various NPCs flooded by the DM. He tells how he wanted to show them to us at the very beginning, but had to hold on for later, as not to spoil us. He goes on about how he has loads of this stuff, whole folders he will share with us every time the campaign reaches a certain point. The player who is into this Strahd kink has started making her own fanfic art, with her character dominated by him, in every sense of the word, mind you. Insinuating being roped by Strahd would be so hot. The other two players are not commenting a thing. So yeah, that is when I peace out and leave the campaign. I'm not a prude and don't mind kinks, but I don't think you should push your kinks into role-playing games, and especially not onto other players who do not consent. I don't know if the other two players stayed in the game, but the next session was being planned when I left the Discord. This was a month ago. The real tragedy is that I never get to play Curse of Strahd properly, now that I've been spoiled about several twists at the beginning. See, this is what I get. I make one horse joke, and I'm immediately greeted with a flaming version of that horse from Berserk. I, I can't win, I swear. I always thought the purpose of the realm of Barovia being dark and edgy was so that the characters have something to contrast them and put their own morals into question. If they just succumb to Strahd without the possibility of being able to fight back, then why are they even here? What do you even get out of this? I'm fine with Grimdark, but the reason why the world is shit is so that individuals within it have a monumental hill that they have to contest in order to find even a little bit of good in it, no matter how fleeting. But yeah, aside from that, uh, don't put your kinks in a game where no one else wants them there except for you, and just be upfront about it. At the very least, you'd earn my respect. Pro here with a bit of a preface to this one. This story was sent to me by user Blademaster Fedora, who gave us a story about a guy at a local game store who tried to be Matthew Mercer. I also had this incredible thumbnail for that video that you as a viewer are obligated to share as a meme whenever a DM does this. You should stop DMing now! Anyway, let's get started. Since my last story gained so much attention, I decided to share another one of my local game store horror stories here. The characters. The mom. Wizard. Her best friend. Fighter. Her son. And yours truly. 
Preface. I'm not making fun of Fighter. He's just a little kid and can't help the way he was raised. I can, however, make fun of the adults in this story, since they fully deserve it for acting like kids. If you haven't read my last story, you should know that before the pandemic hit, I used to DM at a local game store. The owner is a really good friend of mine. Don't get me wrong. I had a ton of fun playing there, and I met a lot of people that I am still friends with to this day. But I also had a few bad encounters. This was one of them. So six months after I started DMing, I decided on running Ghosts of Saltmarsh at the store. The owner's wife approached me one day and told me that a 13-year-old kid wanted to play D&D. But along with the kid also came his mom. She was just there to see if this wouldn't be too violent for the little guy. The kid henceforth shall be known as the fighter, since that was his preferred class. Well, let's just say the violence didn't come from my end. We played the first adventure of Saltmarsh. Fighter ran around the place, trying to decapitate a lot of the NPCs in the dungeon. He also tried to torture one for information, all the while his mom sat next to him, not wanting to play at the table, even though I invited her to. When people visibly got uncomfortable, she proclaimed to the group, let the boy have his fun. The session ended, and I had to cancel the next one due to a family emergency. And since 90% of my regular players were on vacation during the time of my return, I decided to do a beginner's event, where we played Lost Mine of Fandelver. A few weeks pass and the event rolls around. If you wanted to take part in the event, you had to write your name on a sheet in the store. On the day of the event, Fighter and his mom appear, and they wanted to play in the campaign. At that point, all the spots in the campaign were taken. I politely told them that they still have a place in my Saltmarsh campaign, and they can return next week. Fighter and his mom started crying, and I felt insanely uncomfortable. So, I let them play. This is where I also find out that one of the players at the event, Wizard, is actually mom's best friend. The other weird coincidence was that one of my Saltmarsh players lived directly above the mom. So we sat around a table with eight players. I hadn't prepared any more character sheets, so two characters were played by two people each. And again, the fighter was a complete edgelord. He was playing a lawful good character, by the way. He started by cutting off all the goblin's ears, but it got a little better after I took him aside and explained roleplay to him. He was still a loot whore, though. Even though it was kind of chaotic, it was still fun. So I decided to finish Lost Minds of Fandelver on my own time with this group. Two players dropped out after session one, so it all worked out. We played two more sessions. I offered to create a character for the mom, but she declined. She said she just wanted to sit, listen, and take notes for the group. But since this was during the time I was still in college, I always had a bunch of term papers due at the end of each semester. At around this time, I always told the owner that I'll put all D&D stuff on hold. So September rolls around, and I tell everyone in the store's Discord that I will be taking September off. Without even batting an eye, the mom went upstairs to my Saltmarsh player and told him that I refused to DM anymore, and asked him if he could DM the module for the group. I only found out about it because my player jokingly texted me about it. At this point, I was fuming. I got into a huge fight with the mom about it. She apologized after a while. And since I was a big softy back then, I forgave her. Everything went without a hitch until we finished the campaign. The group had a lot of fun playing with me, so they asked if I wanted to DM another campaign for them, to which I agreed. We decided on starting with Dragon of Ice Spire Peak and would go into Storm King's Thunder. This is where the next part of trouble began. Since we finished Lost Minds of Fandelver a week before Christmas, we planned on a get-together for the entire group, a little bit like a Christmas party. This was also during the week my dad came for a visit. He lives on the other side of the country, so I barely get to see him. We all agreed on hanging out at a bar and have a few. I told them I would bring my dad along since he doesn't get out much. Every last member of the group canceled, but not by themselves. Apparently, they all called the mom to cancel and not me whose idea this whole thing was. This was meant to take place on Saturday, since on Sunday, I would take a car ride with my dad to be home for Christmas. The mom used the group chat to organize a separate meeting on Monday, knowing full well I was not in town. It might sound petty now, but remember this for later. Okay, that really stung, but I chalked that up to coincidence. Where it went downhill was the session zero for the next campaign. 
The mom's best friend wizard was still part of the group. He tried to power game and send me builds upon builds for his next character, telling me how awesome they were. Then after a lot of back and forth, he decided to play a bard. A changeling bard, in the Forgotten Realm setting. Also, he wanted his starting equipment to be a double scimitar, bladed quarterstaff, and mithril armor. After that, I got so annoyed that I told him to use the stuff from the player's handbook or to get lost. Time for session zero. Usually, I only use standard array for character creation, and this was definitely one of the reasons why I still do that. But since this was a home campaign, I told the players they could either come to the store on Wednesday before my campaign, or wait until session zero to roll their stats. And it worked out for four of the six players. Again, Wizard was insanely annoying. He tried to record a video of himself rolling out his stats and sending it to me via Discord. I told him to wait for session zero. The fighter was the other one who couldn't wait. He just rolled his stats anyway. And what a dink! He had three 18s. I told him he couldn't use them since I wasn't there when they were rolled. The mom was like, but I was around when he rolled. That should be enough. I let the fighter roll new stats, which still had two 17s and no stat under 14 in it. Fighter got pissed, slammed the door, and cried his eyes out. The mom looked at me like I was the villain. During this awkward situation, I also let slip that Wizard wanted to play a changeling. After the session, he sends me a passive-aggressive text on WhatsApp, stating, I hope no one heard that. That was supposed to be a secret. I wanted to play a new race every session. I decided I had enough after that, and sent out all my grievances to the group in the form of a voicemail, which included the story about trying to get my player to DM, the Christmas story, and the Session Zero fiasco. And the mom texted me. We agreed on meeting up at a bar to talk it out. She told me she was flabbergasted about my voicemail. She insisted that she had only tried to recruit my player because I said I refused to DM for them anymore, which I told her was not true. She insisted that that was what I wrote in the Discord. I pulled out my phone and proved her wrong. Her response was just, oh. Then I confronted her about the Christmas story. Her justification? After work, she just wanted to get a good buzz going, and she told me I shouldn't be mad because maybe we in the group are just not the good friends you thought we were. This was the moment where I should have thrown my drink in her face, to be honest. This was also the time for term papers again. So no matter what, I had to take a D&D break. So when the mom asked me if I wanted to return, she said that I should do it right now or not at all. Because if you don't, you will ruin a relationship with people that deeply care about you. She also told me I embarrassed Fighter in my voicemail and I should apologize to him. After that, I decided to not return at all. Then she tried to pull up my heartstrings. I didn't get to play at all. And now I have to DM. Funny, coming from someone who got offered to play in the last campaign and refused. I also told her that if Wizard is so obsessive with the game, he should DM. Her answer? Not gonna happen. Decided to leave it at that and left. They tried to run Essentials Kit without me. I left the group chat the same weekend. A few weeks later, she came into the local game store with Fighter. He looked at me dead in the eyes and tried to give me the stink eye. Mom went up to me, rudely interrupting a conversation I had with a friend. I was really pissed off at that and barely even acknowledged her existence. After she had left the store, she texted me on WhatsApp, saying I was being rude and shitty and that if I had a problem with her, I should just leave the group chat. And then she realized I had already done so. And she deleted the entire message. A few weeks later, COVID started. She came into the store and complained about how hard DMing was, and apparently after two or three sessions, the group disbanded. That is where the story of the mom ends. Wizard was still in my store campaign. Since again, this was during term paper time, the entire thing was still on hold. But I still ran Descent into Avernus since this was a pretty railroady campaign and easy to prepare for me. So, Wizard texted in the group chat why I was still running the Descent into Avernus campaign. I told him my reason, to which he just replied, You can tell me if you don't want to play with me anymore. That was partly true. The day after that, he went bananas and sent this message in the group chat of the campaign. Since I am now groupless, I'm looking for a spot as a player. Does any one of you have an opening? I decided to block him and the mom. 
Wizard actually managed to find a group afterwards, weirdly enough, in a campaign ran by Power Gamer from the last story. But he got kicked out for hitting on Power Gamer's girlfriend. Wizard is married, by the way. So that was my second local game store horror story. I hope you cringed a bit. I almost had sympathy for Wizard up until that last bit. The only wizard allowed to riz up everyone they meet is Gale, and even that still makes me uncomfortable. Asarian is allowed to do whatever he wants, though. I truly do feel bad for the fighter, even if he does seem like a little shit, but I can only blame his actions in this story almost solely on the mom, who I can comfortably say is responsible for fostering him into becoming the little goblin he is in this story. And the mom herself, well, I can only think of unkind words to say about her manipulative attitude and passive aggression. So in lieu of doing that, here's a picture of a cat. Ah, it almost makes me forget about the bad parenting. But that's going to be it for today's stories, and if you like today's stories, feel free to like this video and subscribe to the channel to follow the latest uploads, and while you're here, leave a comment. Can't think of a comment? Then leave the comment, Mom of the Year. So I know you made it to the end of today's stories. Once again, a special thank you to today's sponsor, Song of Sirens. And I'll see you next time, as the crow flies.